everyone. If you can hear me, um, we are at the brink of uh, uh, something extraordinary uh, right now. We have known for quite some time that uh, it's good to eat fruits and, fruits and vegetables, but uh, uh, accum accumulating evidence has shown the past 10, 20 years that to optimize your diet further, uh, is, uh, the way to go is uh, a plant-based diet with the most, uh, most certainty. Uh, this knowledge uh, is spread by us in Sweden from uh, the Physicians uh, for the Future. And uh, one of our greatest uh, inspirations have been Michael Greger, who is uh, here uh, I, today. I think most of you know him, since you are here. <laughs> but uh, still, a brief introduction. He's uh, a physician. He also has a degree in uh, biology, with a uh, direction towards uh, ag agronomy. Is it correct? Almost correct? Yes. And uh, during our time, at, uh, I mean, my personal time, uh, um, devoting uh, most of my spare time in uh, nutrition, you get in contact with professors and you read uh, uh, a lot of work from di different scholars. And I would personally say that there is, uh, it's very unlikely that there is anyone more has more knowledge about nutrition than Dr. Greger. He reads uh, every English-speaking scientific journal that has to do with anything with nutrition. I don't think any professor or any scholar can match this. And uh, uh, we are also very glad to, um, to have his new book in Swedish. Uh, I have said before, and I said it, and I will say it again, that without question, I would say that right at this moment, this is definitely the best book you can find on diet, nutrition, and health. So make sure you get it. Make sure you get two of them or three. <coughs> Give them away to your relatives, to your friends, your co-workers, and um, enjoy. So uh, with, without further ado, I will now give the word to Michael Greger. A big hand. to yellow, that is to keep the blue rays out of my eyeballs um, uh, when it's getting dark. We're going to turn that off. And this should all of a sudden turn white again. There we go. That's what we want to see. Otherwise, it looks like I have jaundice. We don't want that. <laughs> this is a picture of me taken around the time that my grandmother was diagnosed with end-stage heart disease and sent home to die. She already had so many bypass surgeries, you basically run out of plumbing at some point, could find a wheelchair, crushing chest pain. Her life was over at age 65. Then she heard about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, one of our early lifestyle medicine pioneers, and what happened next is actually detailed in Pritikin's biography. My grandma was one of the death's door people. Frances Greger, my grandmother, arrived in a wheelchair. Mrs. Greger had heart disease, angina, claudication. Her condition so bad, she could no longer walk without great pain in her chest and legs. Within three weeks, though, she was not allowed of her wheelchair. She was walking 10 miles a day. This is a picture of my grandma at her grandson's wedding 15 years after doctors had abandoned her to die. 
She was given a medical death sentence at age 65, but thanks to a healthy diet, was able to enjoy another 31 years on this planet until age 96 to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. That's why I went into medicine. Now, years later, when Dr. Dean Ornish publishes Landmark Lifestyle Heart Trial Proving with something called quantitative angiography that indeed heart disease could be reversed, arteries opened up without drugs, without surgery, just a plant based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors. I assumed this was going to be the game changer. I mean, my family had seen it with their own eyes, but here it was in black and white, published in some of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, yet nothing happened. So wait a second, if effectively the cure to our number one killer could get lost down some rabbit hole and ignored, what else might there be in the medical literature that could help my patients but just didn't have a, a corporate budget driving its promotion? Well, I made it my life's mission to find out. For those of you unfamiliar with my work every year, I do indeed read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal in the world, so busy folks like you don't, don't have to. to. Nice. <laughs> I think of all the most interesting, the most groundbreaking, the most practical findings, the new videos and articles I upload every day to my nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. Everything on the website is free. There are no ads. No corporate sponsorship, strictly non-commercial, not selling anything, just put it up as a public service, as a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandmother. New videos and articles every day on the latest in evidence-based nutrition. What a concept. Okay, so where did Pritikin get his evidence from? Well, a network of missionary hospitals set up throughout Sub-Saharan Africa uncovered what may be one of the most important medical advances of the last century, according to one of our most pre preeminent medical figures of the last century, Dr. Dennis Burkett, the fact that many of the major and commonest diseases were universally rare, like heart disease. In the African population of Uganda, coronary artery disease almost non-existent. You say, wait a second. The number one killer in Sweden, almost non-existent, what were they eating? Well, they were eating lots of vegetables and grains and greens, and their protein almost exclusively from plant sources. And they had the cholesterol levels to prove it, very similar to what one sees in modern day plant eaters. Um, this is milligrams per deciliter. This is about um, 3.75 millimoles per liter, um, which essentially makes one heart attack proof. You say, wait a second. Maybe they were just uh, dying early from something else, never lived long enough to get heart disease. No, here's age match heart attack rates in Uganda versus St. Louis. Out of 632 autopsies in Uganda, only one myocardial infarction. Out of 632 age and gender matched autopsies in Missouri, states 136 myocardial infarctions, more than 100 times the rate of our leading killer. In fact, they were so blown away, went back, did another 800 autopsies in Uganda, still just a one small healed infarct, meaning it wasn't even the cause of death out of 1,427, less than one in a thousand. Whereas here, heart disease is an epidemic. Here's a list of diseases commonly found here in places that eat and live, like um, uh, Europeans, um, that were rare or even non-existent among populations centering their diets around whole plant foods. These are among our most common diseases, like obesity, for example. Hiatal hernia, the most common stomach uh, problem. Uh, diverticulo, excuse me, hemorrhoids, varicose veins, the two most common vein problem. Um, uh, colorectal cancer, the leading cancer killer. Diverticulosis, the most common disease in the intestine. Appendicitis, number one cause of emergency abdominal surgery, gallbladder disease, number one cause of non-emergency abdominal surgery, as well as ischemic heart disease, the commonest cause of death 
in Sweden, uh, but a rarity among plant-based populations which suggests that heart disease may be a choice. Like cavities. You know, if you look at the teeth of people who lived 10,000 years before the invention of the toothbrush, pretty much no cavities. Didn't brush a day in their lives. No flossing. Yet, no cavities. Why? Because candy bars hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> All right, so why do people continue to get cavities when we know they're preventable through changes in our diet? Well, simple. Because the pleasure people derive from dessert may outweigh the cost and discomfort of the dentist chair. And look, that's fine. If, if you're an adult and you believe the benefits outweigh the risk for you and your family, then go for it. I, Certainly enjoy the occasional indulgence. I've got a good dental plan. But what about um, uh, instead of the plaque on our artery, uh, on our teeth? Imagine um, uh, the plaque building up inside of our arteries. Another disease that can be prevented through changes in our diet. Okay, now what are the consequences for you and your family? Now we're not talking about scraping tartar anymore. Now we're talking life and death. It's still up to each of us to make our own decisions as to what to eat and how to live, but we should make these choices consciously, educating ourselves about the predictable consequences of our actions. Atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, a disease that begins in childhood by age 10. Nearly all children raised on the standard Western diet already have uh, what are called fatty streaks, the first stage of the disease building up inside their arteries. These fatty streaks then turn into plaques in our 20s, get worse in our 30s, and then can start killing us off. And our heart is called a heart attack, and our brain, the same disease, can cause a stroke. So if there is anyone here today older than age 10, <laughs> then the question isn't, whether or not to eat healthy to prevent heart disease, it's whether you want to reverse the heart disease you likely already have. But is that even possible? You know, when researchers took people with heart disease, put them on the kind of plant-based diet followed by populations that did not get epidemic heart disease, their hope was, hey, maybe we can slow the disease down, perhaps even stop it. But instead, something miraculous happened. As soon as people stopped eating artery-clogging diets, their bodies were able to start dissolving some of that plaque away, opening up arteries, without drugs, without surgery, suggesting their bodies wanted to be healthy all along, but were just never given the chance. This remarkable improvement in blood flow to the heart muscle itself was after just three weeks of plant-based nutrition. Let me share with you what's been called the best kept secret in all of medicine. The best kept secret in medicine is that sometimes, given the right conditions, the body can actually heal itself. You know, if you, uh, you know, whack your shin really hard on a coffee table and get all red, hot, painful, swollen, inflamed, but will heal naturally if you just stand back and let your body work its magic. But what if you kept whacking your shin in the same place day after day? In fact, three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> uh, you'd never heal. You'd go to your doctor and be like, oh, my shin hurts. And they'd be like, no problem. Whip out their pad, write a prescription for painkillers. You're still whacking your shin three times a day. Oh, it still really hurts like it, but oh, I feel so much better. Those pain pills on board. Thank heavens for modern medicine. It's like when people take nitroglycerin pills for crushing chest pain. Tremendous relief, but you're not doing anything to treat the underlying cause of the disease. Our body wants to come back to health if we let it, but if we keep re-damaging ourselves three times a day, we may never heal. It's like smoking. 
One of the most amazing things I learned in all my medical training was that within about 15 years of stopping smoking, your lung cancer risk approaches that of a lifelong non-smoker. Isn't that amazing? Your lungs can clear out all that tar and eventually it's almost as if you never started eating, never started uh, uh, smoking at all. And every morning of our smoking life, that healing process started to wham, first cigarette of the day. Re-injuring our lungs every puff, just like we can re-injure our arteries with every bite, when all we had to do all along, the miracle cure is to just stand back, get out of the way, right? Stop re-damaging ourselves and let our body's natural healing processes bring us back towards health. The human body is a self-healing machine. Sure, you can choose moderation and hit yourself with a smaller hammer, <laughs> but why beat yourself up at all? This is nothing new. American Heart Journal, 1977. Cases like Mr. F.W., your heart disease so bad couldn't even make it to the mailbox. Started eating healthier. A few months later, he was climbing mountains, no pain. All right? Now, there are these fancy new classes of anti-angina drugs on the market now. Cost thousands of dollars a year. But at the highest dose, may be able to extend exercise duration as long as 33 and a half seconds. <laughs> it does not look like those choosing the drug route will be climbing mountains anytime soon. See, plant-based diets aren't just safer and cheaper, they can work better because you're treating the underlying cause of the disease. Heart disease is killer number one in, this, in, uh, in both Sweden and the United States. Killer number two is cancer. Here's, um, here's the ranking here in Sweden. Number one, ischemic heart disease. So cardiovascular diseases in general, and then if you add up all the various cancers, you can see that actually bumps it up um, to a leading cause of death. What happens when you put cancer on a plant-based diet? Well, Dr. Dean Ornish and colleagues were able to reverse the progression of early stage prostate cancer with the same plant-based diet and lifestyle program, and no wonder. If you take the blood of people eating the standard American diet and drip that blood onto cancer cells growing in the petri dish, you can suppress cancer cell growth a little bit, but if you uh, put people on a plant-based diet for a year, their blood can do that. The blood circulating throughout the bodies of those eating plant-based has nearly eight times the stopping power when it comes to suppressing cancer cell growth. Now this was for men and prostate cancer, they wanted to repeat this study using women and breast cancer, the number one cancer killer among young women, uh, but they didn't want to wait a whole year to get the results. Women are dying now. So they said, let's see what a plant-based diet can do after just two weeks against three different lines of human breast cancer. This is the before cancer cell growth powering away at 100%, and then this is after eating healthy for just two weeks. <laughs> This is what's called a photomicrograph, a photograph taken under a microscope. What they did is they laid down a confluent layer of breast cancer, a carpet of breast cancer, and then they dripped the blood of women eating the standard American diet onto that cancer. And you can see it kind of breaks the cancer up in these kind of cancer continents here. But then you take these same women, put them on a plant-based diet, and retest two weeks later. So same women, they act as their own controls. This is the before put them on a plant-based diet for two weeks, and then lay down another layer of cancer, drip their blood two weeks later, and all we're left with is this. Just a few individual cancer cells left their bodies cleaned up. Before and after, just two weeks eating healthy. Their bloodstream became that much more inhospitable to cancer. Now, suppressing cancer cell growth is nice, getting rid of it is even better. This is what's called apoptosis, programmed cell death, where our bodies kind of reprogram cancer cells, forcing them into early retirement. This is what's called tunnel imaging, measuring DNA fragmentation or cell death, where dying cancer cells show up as little white spots, so for example, here. So even if you're a 
a woman eating a pretty poor diet, you're not completely defenseless, you can kill off a few cancer cells, but then you take these same women, put them on a plant-based diet, and two weeks later their blood can do that. The same blood now circulating throughout these women's bodies gained the power to significantly slow down and stop breast cancer cell growth after just two weeks eating healthy. What kind of blood do you want in your body? What kind of immune system? Do we want blood that just kind of rolls over when new cancer cells pop up? Or do we want blood circulating to every nook and cranny in our body with the power to slow down and stop? Now this dramatic strengthening in cancer defenses was after two weeks of a plant-based diet and exercise. They had these women out walking 30 to 60 minutes a day. So wait a second. If you do two things, how do you know what role the diet played? So researchers decided to put it to the test. This is a cancer cell clearance um, in the diet and exercise group as we saw before. Plant-based diet on average for 14 years along with daily mild exercise like going out for a walk every day. Plant-based diet and walking, that's the kind of cancer cell clearance you can get. Compare that to the cancer stopping power of your average um, sedentary, you can see a little cheeseburger there, I don't know if that. Average uh, uh, sedentary eater, um, which is essentially non-existent. All right, but here's the interesting group in the middle. What about 14 years kind of standard Western diet, but 14 years daily, strenuous, hour-long exercise like calisthenics. <laughs> they want to know if you exercise long enough, if you exercise hard enough, can you rival some strolling plant eaters over here? <laughs> and the answer is exercise helped, no question. But literally 5,000 hours in the gym was no match for a plant-based diet. Here's that same tunnel image we saw before. Even if you were a couch potato, living off of fried potatoes, you're not totally defenseless. You can knock off a few cancer cells. You exercise for 5,000 hours. You can kill off cancer cells left and right. But nothing appears to kick more cancer tush than a plant-based <laughs> diet. We think this is because animal protein, meat, egg white, and dairy protein, increases the levels in our body of a cancer-promoting growth hormone called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one, evolved in the acquisition and progression of malignant tumors. But if you cut down your intake of animal protein, your um, IGF-1 levels drop and if, after two weeks. And if you continue to eat healthy, they drop even further and your levels of IGF-1 binding protein go up. IGF-1 binding protein is like our body's emergency brain. It's one of our ways our body protects itself from cancer, protects itself from excessive growth. Sure, in as few as two weeks, you could drop your body's production of IGF-1, but wait a <coughs> second. What about all the IGF-1 circulating in your system from the bacon and eggs you had three weeks ago? Well, your liver releases the snatch squad of binding proteins to tie up any excess IGF-1, pull it out of the system, your protected levels go up within weeks, benefits continue to accrue the longer you eat healthy. Here's the experiment that nailed IGF-1 as the villain, same thing we saw before, healthy diet and exercise, cancer cell growth drops, cancer cell death shoots up. But here's the interesting column here, what if you add back to the cancer just the amount of IGF-1 uh, that you banish from your system because you started eating healthy, what happens? You effectively erase the diet and exercise effect. It's almost as if you never started eating healthy at all. So this is why we think that you know, some of the largest studies on diet and cancer in history have shown that the incidence of all cancers combined was lower among those eating more plant-based is because they're eating less animal protein, less meat, egg, white, and dairy protein, so they have less IGF-1 in their systems, so they have less cancer growth. How much less cancer growth? Well, if you follow thousands of uh, older men and women uh, for years, those who have high protein intake, about 75% increased risk of dying prematurely, period, and about fourfold risk of dying specifically from cancer. But not all proteins, specifically just the animal protein, which makes sense 
given the higher IGF-1 levels in people that eat animal protein. The academic institution where the study was done sent out a press release with a memorable opening line. That chicken wing you're eating could be as deadly as a cigarette. Explaining that, look, quadrupling one's risk of dying from cancer, that's comparable to what one might get smoking cigarettes. Okay, so what was the reaction in the scientific community? to this revelation that diets high in meat, eggs, and dairy could be harmful to the health of smoking. Well, one nutrition scientist said it was potentially dangerous to tell people about this study. Why? Because a smoker might think, hey, why bother quitting smoking if my ham and cheese sandwich is just as bad for me? <laughs> so let's not tell anyone about this old meat and dairy thing. Shh. It reminds me of this famous Philip Morris cigarette ad that actually ran in Europe, but not in the States, that tried to downplay the risks by saying, hey, you think secondhand smoke is bad? Increasing your risk of lung cancer 19%? Well, hey, drinking one or two glasses of milk every day, maybe three times is bad, 62% increased risk of lung cancer. Or doubling your risk frequently cooking with oil, tripling your risk of heart disease by eating non-vegetarian, multiplying risk sixfold. They eat lots of meat and dairy, so they conclude. Let's keep some perspective here. <laughs> the risk from secondhand smoke may be well below that of other everyday um, uh, activities. So breathe deep. <laughs> This is like saying, yeah, don't worry about getting stabbed, because getting shot so much worse. Uh, how about neither? Two risks don't make a right. Of course, you'll note Philip Moore stopped throwing dairy under the bus once they purchased Kraft Foods. Just saying. All right. Uh, well, let me, uh, I'm going to go down the list in the... Um, of uh, the U.S. cause of this actually very similar to here in Sweden. Um, uh, the top three killers um, in the States used to be heart disease, um, uh, cancer, stroke, but that was back in 2007. Now um, it's uh, heart disease, um, cancer, and COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases like emphysema. Thankfully, a plant-based diet can be used to help prevent COPD. It can even be used to treat COPD, significantly improving <laughs> lung function over time. But the tobacco industry had a very different take on the study. If adding plants to our diets can improve lung function, wouldn't it be easier to just add plants to cigarettes? And indeed, the addition of acai berries to cigarettes evidently has a protective effect against emphysema in smoking mice. <laughs> Who would have thunk it? Right? Next, they're going to start adding berries to meat. And indeed, I couldn't make this stuff up, ladies and gentlemen. The addition of fruit extracts to burger patties was not without its glitches. For example, the blackberries dyed the burger patties a distinct purplish color, kind of turned people off a little bit. Though evidently, you can't improve the tenderness of lamb carcasses if you infuse them before rigor mortis sets in with kiwi fruit juice. You can even improve the nutritional profile of frankfurters by adding powdered grape seeds, uh, though there were complaints that the grape seed particles became visible in the final product. And, you know, if there's one thing we know about hot dog eaters is that they're picky about what goes in their food. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pig anus, and, but grape seeds, ew! <laughs> All right, uh, killer number four is stroke. Um, which is actually, uh, um, uh, maybe actually be killer number two here in Sweden. Preventing strokes may be all about eating potassium-rich foods. Yet in the States, for example, most Americans don't even reach the recommended minimum daily intake of potassium. By most, we're talking more than 98%. More than 98% uh, don't eat enough potassium because more than 98% don't eat enough plants. Potassium comes with the words pot ash. Take any plant, put it in a pot, reduce the ash, and left with potassium, potassium, so-called vegetable alkali. But who can name me one plant food in particular high in potassium? Banana. 
Banana. Of course, bananas. You know, it's funny, I you know, travel all over the world, and that's like the one thing everybody seems to know about nutrition. <laughs> bananas have to, like, I don't know, like Chiquita had this great PR firm or something, but uh, it turns out bananas don't even make the top 50 sources. Coming in at number 86, right after fast food vanilla milkshakes. It goes right, and then bananas. <laughs> It's funny, when I was writing the new book, I went back to check to see if it changed at all, and actually the USDA Nutrient Database has since expanded now. Bananas don't even make the top thousand sources, coming in at number 1,161, right after Reese's Pieces. Did you not? Um, the most concentrated sources of potassium you can get is number one, greens. Number two, beans. And number three, dates dried fruit days. Um, and again, bananas don't even make the top thousand. If you had, in fact, if you look at the next leading cause of death, bananas could be downright dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Alzheimer's disease is next, actually a little bit higher if you're in Sweden. Um, in the States, four million Americans affected. Um, uh, you know, 20 years ago, it wasn't even in the top 10. According to the latest dietary guidelines for the prevention of Alzheimer's disease, the two most important things we can do, number one, cut down our intake of meat, dairy, and junk, and increase our intake of vegetables, legumes, which are beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, fruits, and whole grains. This is based in part on data going back decades now, showing that those who eat meat, red meat, White meat, doesn't matter. Between two to three times the risk of becoming demented later in life, and the longer one ate healthy, the lower one's risk appeared to drop. Killer number seven, uh, type two diabetes, a disease we've known we can both prevent and reverse with a plant-based diet since the 1930s, um, where a small group of diabetics were put on a plant-based diet within a period of five years, a qu about a quarter of them were able to get off insulin altogether, but plant-based diets tend to be relatively low-calorie diets, such that, well, wait a second, maybe their diabetes just got better because they lost so much weight. I mean, to tease that out, but what you'd have to do is put people on a plant-based diet, but force them to eat so much food that they don't lose any weight. Then we could see if plant-based diets have particular benefits beyond just all the easy weight loss. Well, we'd have to wait a few decades, but here it is. <laughs> Subjects were weighed every day. They started to lose weight. They were made to eat more food. In fact, so much more food. Some of the participants had problems eating it all. They're like, oh, not another salad. Ugh. But eventually, they adapted, so no weight loss, despite restricting meat, eggs, dairy, and junk food. Okay, so with zero weight loss, was there still a benefit for their diabetes? Well, insulin needs were cut 60% across the board. Half the diabetics ended off all their insulin altogether. Wow, how many years did that take? No, 16 days. 16 days later. So we're talking diabetics. Who, injected, who had diabetes for as long as 20 years, injecting 20 units of insulin a day, then 13 days later on none. Diabetes for 20 years, then off all insulin in less than two weeks. Diabetes for 20 years because no one had told them about a plant-based diet. For decades, they were 13 days away at any time. Here's participant number 15. 32 units of insulin on the control diet, then 18 days later on none. Lower blood sugars on 32 units, less insulin. That's the power of plants. And remember, this was with zero weight loss. His body just started working that much better. What are the side effects? How about cholesterol's dropping like a rock to under 150? Um, uh, under 3.75 or so, 
um, again, only in about two weeks' time. So just like asking people to make moderate changes in their diet will only get you kind of modest reductions in cholesterol, how moderate do you want your diabetes? Everything in moderation may be a truer statement than many people realize. Right? Asking our diabetic patients to make moderate changes in diet can leave them with moderate blindness, moderate kidney failure, Moderate amputation, maybe just a few toes or something. <laughs> Moderation in all things is not necessarily a good thing. Remember that study that purported to show that diets high meat, eggs, and dairy could be harmful to the health of smoking? Supposedly suggested those who eat a lot of meat, eggs, and dairy four times as likely to die from cancer or diabetes. But if you look at the actual study, you'll see that's simply not true. Those eating lots of animal protein during middle age didn't have four times the risk of dying from diabetes. They had 73 times the risk of dying from diabetes. Now, those that chose moderation, only eating a moderate amount of animal protein, oh, they just had 23 times the risk of death from diabetes. <coughs> Killer number eight, kidney failure. Um, uh, a uh, disease we can both help prevent and treat with a plant-based diet, and no wonder, kidneys are highly vascular organs, so no surprise, Harvard researchers found three dietary risk factors for declining kidney function. Number one is animal protein, number two, animal fat, number three, cholesterol. Uh, animal fat can alter the actual structure of the human kidney. Um, based on studies like this showing plugs of fat literally clogging up the works in autopsied human kidneys. And animal protein can play, a, have a profound effect on normal kidney function, inducing something called hyperfiltration, increasing the workload on the kidneys, but not plant protein. So if you give people a single meal of tuna fish, right? You get significant increased pressure in the kidneys one, two, three hours after a meal of both non-diabetics and diabetics. Now, so we're not talking adverse effects like decades down the road, but literally within hours of it going into our mouths. Now you say, wait, what if you ate the exact same amount of protein, but instead of a tuna fish salad sandwich, you had a tofu salad sandwich? What would happen? Absolutely nothing. Your bodies can handle plant protein without even batting an eyelash. So why does animal protein cause that overload reaction, but not plant protein? Well, we think it's because of the inflammation triggered by the consumption of animal products. How do we know that? Because if you give a powerful anti-inflammatory drug along with that tuna fish, you can abolish that hyperfiltration protein leakage response to meat ingestion. And then there's the acid load. The consumption of foods like meat, eggs, and dairy induces the formation of acid within the kidneys, um, which can cause something called tubular toxicity, damage to the delicate urine-making tubes within the kidneys. Animal foods tend to be acid-forming, particularly fish, which is the worst, but then pork, poultry, on down the list, whereas plant foods tend to either be kind of neutral or actually base forming alkaline, particularly dark green leafy vegetables, to counteract some of the acids formed from our diet. So the key to halting the progression of chronic kidney disease may lie in the produce aisle or the farmer's market rather than the pharmacy. No surprise then that plant-based diets have been used to treat kidney failure for decades now. Here's protein leakage on the standard low-sodium diet. That's typically what we physicians would put people on with their declining kidney function. But then they switched them in the study to a supplemented vegan diet, then back to conventional, plant-based. Conventional, plant-based, switching on and off kidney dysfunction like a light switch based on what was going into their mouth. Killer number nine, it re lower respiratory infections like influenza. What possible role could diet play in respiratory infections? Well, you may not have seen my video, Kale of the Immune System, talking about the immunostimulatory effects of kale. Is there anything kale cannot do? 
boosting antibody production sevenfold, but this is in a petri dish, what about in people? If you take older men and women, 50s, 60s, 70s, right before getting their Pneumovax vaccination, their pneumonia vaccination, split them up into two groups, half continuing their regular diet, the other half, you just add a few servings of fruits and vegetables and you get a significantly boosted protective antibody response uh, by adding fruits and vegetables. This is not cutting out meat. Just adding some fresh produce can significantly boost one's immune function. Killer number 10 is suicide. This is actually one of the few leading causes of death that's actually higher in Sweden than in the United States. Uh, we've known for a long time that people that eat healthier tend to feel healthier. In fact, only about half of the depression, anxiety, and stress scores compared to those eating uh, more conventional diets. What we think is going on is that there's this arachidonic acid, um, which is this long-chain inflammatory omega-6 fatty acid found in animal products um, uh, that uh, may be impairing people's mood. It's found mostly in chicken and eggs, um, also beef sausage on down the list, but predominantly chicken and eggs. So what researchers did is they took people, removed eggs, removed chicken, removed other meat, and got a significant improvement in mood within just two weeks. It can take drugs, sometimes months to take them. In fact, significant improvement in mood within two weeks. And so what we think is going on is that this arachidonic acid was adversely impacting mental health via a cascade of neuroinflammation, brain inflammation. But we may be able to clear that inflammation from our brains in as few as two weeks by cutting down our consumption of eggs, chicken, and other meat. Um, I say, wait a second. Am I just cherry picking here? What about all the other diets that have been proven to improve mood? There aren't any. So there's a recent meta-analysis found that the only diet ever in this randomized control kind of trial to improve mood over any duration was a plant-based diet. It's hard to cherry pick when there's only one cherry. <laughs> Works in a workplace setting too. This is at Geico Insurance in Washington, D.C. What they did is they went in and gave weekly educational seminars uh, and then added healthy options to the workplace cafeteria. Got significant improvements, not only physical function, general health, vitality, all the things you'd expect from eating healthier, but also improved mental health. And this led to improved worker productivity, which is of course what the company cared about. So they took it nationwide. 10 corporate sites across the country, half continued to do nothing, just regular. Um, but the other half, again, free weekly educational seminars, which were optional, and they just gave um, uh, healthy options in the cafeteria. They didn't take anything away, but they added you know, lentil soup, bean burritos, healthy food, and got significant improvements in depression, anxiety, fatigue, emotional well-being, daily functioning, emotional health. So, you know, lifestyle interventions like exercise can have both physical and mental health benefits, and from a dietary standpoint, plant-based diets have the um, greatest evidence base. Killer number 11, systemic blood infection. Sure, there are foodborne bacteria that can burrow through the intestinal wall again to the bloodstream, or in women, can crawl up into their bladders. We know for decades now, it's actually bacteria crawling up from the rectum that cause bladder infections in women, but we didn't know where this reservoir of bladder infected E. coli was coming from until now. And that is chicken, chicken. Um, that this is where these UTI-causing bacteria reside. We now have DNA fingerprinting proof of a direct link between farm animals, uh, meat, and bladder infections in women. Solid evidence um, that the urinary tract infections can be what's called a zoonosis, an animal-to-human disease. So wait a second. Who undercooks chicken? Can't you just use a meat thermometer, cook the meat through? What's the big deal? The big deal is what's called cross-contamination. You take 40 families, give them a frozen chicken to prepare and cook in their homes as they normally would. Um, uh, you can uh, then, multitudes of antibiotics resistant bacteria jump from the chicken into the guts of the volunteers even before they eat it. So you can incinerate that chicken to ash. You don't even have to eat any of it. You're already infected before it makes it into the oven. <coughs> 
Within days, the chicken bacteria had multiplied to the point of becoming a major part of the person's gut flora. Chicken bacteria was like taking over. So wait a second, what if you teach people not just safe cooking guidelines, but safe handling guidelines, um, which in the States, um, the USDA recommends that all common kitchen surfaces be sprayed with a bleach solution after having any fresh or frozen poultry in the house. So they told people how to do this, and then gave them the chicken again, came in later, swabbed around their kitchen, and still found significant levels of Salmonella, Campylobacter, serious human pathogens um, on some utensils, dishcloth, counter, sink rim, uh, cupboard. Uh, so the reason that people have more bacteria from feces in their kitchen sink compared to their toilet seat <laughs> is because people tend to rinse chickens in the sink, not the toilet. <laughs> Now the good news is, it's not like you eat chicken once and you're colonized for life. In this uh, experiment, the chicken bacteria only seemed to last for about 10 days before the person's good bacteria could muscle it out of the way. The problem is that many families eat chicken more than once every 10 days. So they be constantly reintroducing these chicken bugs, which can lay in wait in their rectum, crawl up, and cause um, uh, thousands of bladder infections, some of which can get really quite Serious. Wait a second, you can't sell unsafe toys, you can't sell unsafe cars. How is it even legal to sell unsafe meat? Well, they do it by blaming the consumers. So, raw meats are not idiot proof, says one USDA poultry microbiologist. They can be mishandled when they're actually like handling a hand grenade. You pull the pin, someone's gonna get hurt. <laughs> Now, while some may question the wisdom of selling hand grenades in supermarkets, our poultry microbiologists disagree, saying, no, it's the consumer that has the most responsibility, just refuses to accept it. It's like, a, it's like a car company saying, yeah, we installed faulty brakes, but it's your fault for not you know, putting your kid in the seatbelt or something. <laughs> the head of the Centers for Disease Control's Food Poisoning Division famously responded to this blame the victim attitude coming from the meat industry, is it reasonable, she asked. Is it reasonable that if a consumer undercooks a hamburger, their three-year-old dies? Is that reasonable? Not to worry, the meat industry's on it. They now have FDA approval in the States for a bacteria-eating virus they can spray on the meat. Um, there's been a little industry concern about consumer acceptance of these so-called bacteria factors may present some of a challenge to the industry, so of course, they're not gonna label it or anything, but if they think that's gonna be a challenge, check out their other bright idea. The effect of extracted housefly pupae, this is a science-y way of saying they wanna smear a maggot mixture on the meat. Now, it's a low cost and simple, think about it. <laughs> Look, maggots thrive off of rotting flesh. However, there have been no reports of maggots having any serious diseases. So hey, they must be filled with some kind of antibacterial something, right? Have you ever seen a maggot sneeze? I didn't think so. So, let's take some maggots, grow them three days old, wash them off, tie them off, a little Vitamix action here, voila, safer meats. We talked about kidney failure, what about liver failure? We've known for decades, you can actually treat liver failure with a plant-based diet, significantly reducing the toxins that would otherwise build up eating meat without a fully functional liver to detoxify your blood. Though one does have to admit there are some people consuming plant-based diets with worsening liver function. They're called Alcoholics living off of potatoes and corn and barley, and strictly plant-based, but not doing so well. We're not sure. <clears throat> uh, and then high blood pressure, um, which affects, in the state, 78 million Americans. That's about one in three American adults. Um, and as we age, our pressures get higher and higher. Such that by age 60, most of us have high blood pressure. So wait a second, if most of us 
have high blood pressure by the time we hit uh, age 60. Maybe it's less a uh, disease and more just a natural inevitable consequence of aging. Nope, we've known since the 1920s that high blood pressure need not occur. Uh, blood pressure is taken of a thousand people living in rural Kenya. Um, a typical Kenyan diet, um, something like, oh, well, so our pressures go up as we age, such that where most of us are high blood pressure at age 60, their pressures go down. Um, and uh, and uh, they're eating and living healthier. Um, and um, we now have evidence, even people under 120 over 80, under so-called normal blood pressure, may benefit from blood pressure reduction. So the ideal blood pressure, the no benefit from reducing it further blood pressure, 110 over 70. One ten. Is it even possible to get pressures down to 110 over 70? It's not just possible, it's normal for those living healthy enough lives. A few years of this rural Kenyan hospital, 1,800 patients were admitted. Um, how many cases of high blood pressure did they find? Mm, zero. Wow. <laughs> they must have low rates of heart disease, right? No, they had no rates of heart disease. Not a single case of atherosclerosis. Our number one killer was found. Rural China, same thing. About 110 over 70 their entire lives. 70-year-old, same average blood pressure as 16-year-olds. So wait a second. African diet? Asian diet, vastly different diets. What they shared in common is that they're plant-based day to day with meat only eaten on special occasions. So wait a second, why do we think it's the plant-based nature of their diet that was so protective? Because in the Western world, the only groups of folks getting it down that low on average were the strict vegetarians. Um, uh, um, the, um, uh, which what they called vegans back then. Um, uh, coming in at about 110 over 65. Here's the largest study of plant-based eaters in history. Uh, the Adventist II study looking at 89,000 Californians comparing non-vegetarians to so-called semi-vegetarians or flexitarians. Those that eat meat more like on a once a week basis rather than a daily basis. Uh, compared to uh, people who eat no meat except fish. Compared to people who eat no meat at all. Compared to those who eat no meat, eggs, or dairy. And uh, you got to keep in mind, these were Adventist non-vegetarians, feel that the body is a temple, there's a very healthy group of meat eaters, didn't eat a lot of meat, um, uh, ate lots of fruits and vegetables, exercised, tended not to smoke. Um, so a very healthy group, but still, we see this stepwise drop in high blood pressure rates the more and more plant-based uh, one gets. Same thing with diabetes. Same thing with obesity. Right? So yeah, sure, we can throw the vast majority out of our risk, of our risk out the window by eating strictly plant-based, but it's not all or nothing. It's not black or white. Any movement we can make along this spectrum towards eating healthier can accrue significant benefits. You can show this experimentally. You take vegetarians, you give them meat, pay them enough to eat it, and their blood pressures go up. Or you take people who already eat meat, remove meat from the diet, their blood pressures go down within seven days. And this is after the vast majority had to stop their blood pressure medications or reduce their blood pressure medications they had to. I mean, you can't treat the cause. Right? You can't have normal blood pressure and be on multiple blood pressure medications. You drop your pressures too low. It can be dangerous. Right? So lower pressures on fewer drugs. That's the power of plants. Does the American Heart Association, for example, recommend a no meat diet? No, they recommend this low meat diet, so called DASH diet. So, wait a second. When this DASH diet was being created, were they just not aware of this landmark research done by Harvard's Frank Sachs? Uh, no, they, they were aware. The chair of the design committee that came up with the DASH diet was Frank Sachs. <laughs> See, the DASH diet was created with the number one goal of capturing the blood pressure lowering benefits of plant-based eating, yet contain enough animal products to make it palatable to the general population. They didn't think the public could handle the truth. Right? Now you can see what they were thinking. Just like drugs never work, unless you actually take them, 
diets never work unless you actually eat them. So they're like, look, we can't tell everyone needs strictly plant-based. No one's going to do that. So if we soft-pedal the message, come up with some kind of compromised diet, on a population scale, we'll do more good. Okay. Tell that to the thousand American families a day that lose a loved one to high blood pressure. Maybe it's time to start telling the public the truth. Kill number 14 is Parkinson's disease. Does a plant-based diet reduce one's risk for Parkinson's disease? Well, we know that most studies done today looking at milk or dairy products have found an increased risk for Parkinson's associated with um, dairy consumption. Why might that be? Well, there's evidence um, that uh, milk supply is contaminated by neurotoxic chemicals. So, for example, high levels of organochlorine pesticides found not only in the milk supply, but in certain regions of the brains of Parkinson's victims on autopsy, um, implicated in the disease. They're talking about pollutants like tetrahydroisoquinoline, which is actually what scientists give in a laboratory setting to primates to, to cause Parkinson's, found mostly in cheese, actually. So there's been calls in the dairy industry to pretty please test their um, products for toxins. Good luck with that. Of course, you could just not drink it, but then what would happen to your bones? <laughs> That's a marketing ploy. If you look at the actual science, you'll see that milk does not appear to protect against hip fracture risk, whether you're drinking it as an adult, whether you're drinking it as a teenager, doesn't matter, doesn't work, may actually increase the risk of um, a fracture, which may explain that countries with the highest dairy consumption actually have the highest fracture rates. So researchers in this obscure country called Sweden decided <laughs> to put it to the test. So um, uh, 100,000 men and women followed for years, um, and milk drinking women had higher rates of what? Higher rates of death from all causes. Significantly more cardiovascular disease, um, for, and significantly more cancer for each daily glass of milk. Those women, those Swedish women, unfortunate enough to be drinking three glasses of milk every day, had nearly twice the risk of dying prematurely, um, and they had more bone and hip fracture um, uh, rates. So more milk, more fractures, and milk drinking men also had higher rates of death. Uh, yet for some reason, you don't see, you know, milk ads like this. I'm not sure exactly what the... <laughs> and finally, aspiration pneumonia, which is caused by swallowing difficulties due to a stroke or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, things we've already talked about. Okay, so here's the top 15 causes of death. And a plant-based diet uh, may help prevent nearly all of them, can be used to treat more than half of them and even reverse the course of disease, and some of them include it, in some cases, our top three killers. Now look, there are drugs that can help too. There's cholesterol lowering drugs for your heart. There's insulin injections and various kind of sugar pills for diabetes. Usually there's a couple different classes of high blood pressure medications to force people's blood pressures down, but the same diet does it all. It's not like there's some kind of heart healthy diet that's somehow different from a brain healthy diet. No, no, a kidney healthy diet is a liver healthy diet, is a whole body healthy diet, one diet to rule them all. <laughs> and what about drug side effects? I'm not talking about a little rash or something. Prescription drugs kill. More than 100,000 Americans at least every year. These are deaths by adverse drug reactions. Not overdose, not medical mistakes, or me these are drugs taken as prescribed by doctors, um, killing off more than 100,000 people. And so you say, wait a second, 106,000 deaths every year? That means the sixth leading cause of death is doctors. <laughs> the sixth leading cause of death is me. Thankfully, I can be prevented with a plant-based diet. <laughs> now seriously, compared to 15,000 uh, uh, vegetarians, those are the meat about twice the odds of being on aspirin, sleeping pills, tranquilizers, antacids, painkillers, blood pressure medications, laxatives, of course, as well as insulin. So plant-based diets are great for people that don't like taking drugs, for people that don't like paying for drugs, people that don't like risking drug side effects. 
Um, so, want to solve the healthcare crisis? I have a suggestion. Um, you know, there's only one diet. If there's one takeaway, if someone asks you, well, wait a second, what did you learn at that at the talk the other day? Here's the take. There's only one diet ever proven to reverse heart disease, the number one cause of death in Sweden. And that's a plant-based diet. So anytime anyone tries to sell you it's a new diet they heard about, do me a favor and ask them one simple question. Say, well, wait a second. Has this new diet been proven to reverse you know, heart disease, the number one reason me and all my loved ones will die? I mean, if the answer is no. Why would you even consider it? If that's all a plant-based diet could do, reverse the number one killer of Swedish men and women. Uh, shouldn't that kind of be the default diet to prove it otherwise? <laughs> and the fact that it can also be effective in preventing and arresting and reversing other leading killers like high blood pressure and type 2 diabetes would seem to make the case of plant-based eating simply overwhelming. Most deaths in the United States and most Western worlds are preventable related to nutrition. Uh, according to the Global Burden of Disease Study, this is the largest study of risk factors for disease um, in human history, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The number one cause of death in the United States is the American diet. The number one cause of disability in the United States is the American diet. Now bumping tobacco uh, to number two, cigarettes only kill about a half a million Americans every year, whereas our diet kills hundreds of thousands more. But of course, America is known for its super lousy diet. What about here in lovely Sweden? Well, guess what? <laughs> the number one cause of death in Sweden is the Swedish diet. <laughs> number two, high blood pressure, uh, also related to diet. Number three, obesity, also related to diet. Number four, smoking. So you know all the laws and regulations and public health campaigns uh, to keep people to, to lower smoking rates. Well, wait a second. Why is it more being done um, for diet, which kills and disables even more people? And physical activity comes down around number five. So again, right? Everybody knows exercise is important, but even more important is the deaths due to diet. So if most deaths are preventable related to nutrition, then obviously, the number one thing taught in medical school is nutrition, right? I mean, the number one thing that your doctor talks to you about at every visit is nutrition, right? So wait a second. How could there be this disconnect between the science and the practice of medicine? Well, let me close with a, with a kind of a thought experiment. Imagine yourself a smoker back in the 1950s or so. Back in the 50s, over in the States, um, the average per capita cigarette consumption was 4,000 cigarettes a year, meaning the average person walking around smoked half pack a day, on average. The media was telling people to smoke, famous athletes agreed, even Santa Claus wanted to do the smoke. <laughs> I mean, look. You want to keep fit and stay out, stay slender, so you make sure to smoke and eat lots of hot dogs to stay trim and eat lots of sugar to stay slim and trim, a lot better than that apple there. I mean, sheesh, right? <laughs> Though apples do connote goodness and freshness, reads one internal tobacco industry memo, which brings up many possibilities for youth-oriented. They want to make apple-flavored cigarettes for kids. Shameless. For digestion's sake, you smoke. I mean, no curative powers claimed by Philip Morris, but better be safe than sorry and smoke. Blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. No woman ever says, no, they're so round, so firm, so fully packed. <laughs> After all, John Wayne smoked them until he got lung cancer and died. 
You know, back then, even the paleo folks were smoking. <laughs> and so were the doctors. Now, this is not to say there wasn't controversy within the medical profession. Sure, you know, some doctors smoke uh, camels, but others uh, preferred Lucky, so there was a little disagreement there. <laughs> The leader of the U.S. Senate agreed. Who wouldn't want to give their throat a vacation? Not a single case of throat irritation. How could there be when cigarettes are just as pure as the water you drink? <laughs> Maybe over in Flint, Michigan. <clears throat> but don't worry. If your throat does get irritated, no problem. Your doctor can just write you a prescription four cigarettes. This is in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So when the AMA is saying that smoking on average is good for you, when the American Medical Association is saying that where could you turn back then if you just wanted the facts? What's the new data advanced by science? Well, she was too tired for fun, and then she smoked a camel. <laughs> Babe Ruth spoke of proof positive medical science, that is when he still could speak, before he died of throat cancer. Now, by some miracle back then, we had a smokingfacts.org website that could deliver the science directly, bypassing commercially corruptible institutional filters. You would have become aware of studies like this. This is an Adventist study out of California in 1958 showing that non-smokers had at least 90% less lung cancer than smokers. This wasn't the first. When famed surgeon Michael DeBakey was asked why his studies back in the 30s linking lung cancer and smoking were simply ignored, he had to remind people what it was like back then. We were a smoking society. It was in the movies. It was on airplanes. It was everywhere. Medical meetings were one heavy haze of smoke. Smoking was, in a word, normal. All right. Well, back to our thought experiment here. If you're a smoker in the 50s in the know, what do you do? I mean, with access to the science, you realize the best available balance of evidence suggests your smoking habit not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? I mean, if you wait until your doctor tells you between puffs to quit, you have cancer by then. If you wait until the powers that be officially recognize it, like the Surgeon General did in the subsequent decade, it can be dead by it. It took more than 7,000 studies and the deaths of countless smokers before the first Surgeon General's report against smoking came out. You think maybe after the first 6,000 studies, it could give people a little heads up or something? <laughs> Powerful industry, right? Maybe we should have stopped smoking after the 700th study like this. As a smoker in the 50s, on one hand, you had all of society, the government, the medical profession itself telling you to smoke. And on the other hand, all you had was the science. If you're even aware of studies like this. Well, let's fast forward 55 years. You know, there's a new Adventist study out of California warning Americans about something else they may be putting in their mouths. Of course, it's not just one study. Put all the studies together. And uh, death from all causes put together, many of our dreaded diseases significantly lower among those eating more plant-based. So, instead of someone going along with America's smoking habits in the 50s, imagine you, someone you know, going along with America's or Sweden's eating habits today. What do you do? I mean, access to the signs, you realize the best available balance of evidence suggests eating habits are oh, not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? If you wait until your doctor tells you between bites to change, it can be too late. In fact, even after the Surgeon General's report came out, the American medical community still dragged their feet. The AMA actually went on record refusing to endorse the Surgeon General's report. Why? Couldn't have been because they were just handed a $10 million check from the tobacco industry? Maybe. <laughs> Okay, so we know why the AMA was sucking up to the tobacco industry. Why weren't more individual doctors speaking up? There were a few ahead of their time speaking up against industries, killing millions, but why not more? Maybe it's because the majority 
of physicians themselves smoke cigarettes. Just like the majority of physicians today continue to eat foods that are contributing to our epidemics of dietary disease. What was the AMA's rallying cry back then? Everything in moderation. Extensive scientific studies have proven smoking in moderation. Oh, that's fine. Sound familiar? Food industry used the same tobacco industry tactics, twisting the signs, misinformation. The same scientists for hire paid to downplay the risk of tobacco smoke and toxic chemicals are the same paid for by the National Confectioners Association to downplay the risks of candy and the same paid for by the meat industry to downplay the risks of meat. Whereas processed foods and animal foods may be killing off 14 million people around the world every year. Those of us involved in this evidence-based nutrition revolution, talking 14 million lives in the balance. Maybe plant-based nutrition should be considered kind of the nutritional equivalent of stopping smoking. But how long do we have to wait before our health authorities say, don't wait for open heart surgery, uh, to start eating healthier as well. Until the system changes, we need to take personal responsibility for our own health, for our family's health. We can't wait until society catches up to the science again because it's a matter of life and death. A few years ago, Dr. Kim Williams became president of the American College of Cardiology. He was asked in an interview why he himself follows the same diet he recommends to all his patients, a strictly plant-based diet. I don't mind dying, Dr. Williams replied. I just don't want it to be my own fault. Thank you so much. <laughs> Who's got a question? Yes. I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh, she's coming. Never mind. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm, my name is Pat, and what I'm uh, since we're in Sweden. Uh, we recommend it to not consume ground flax seeds. Whereas in your app, David Dustin, you recommend either one to two tablespoons a day of ground flax seeds. Uh, what does the science say about it? The science um, says eat your flax seeds. The, it's interesting, the, um, there are two editions. So the, my book was uh, published in 23 languages. And there's two countries that demanded I make an addendum. So one was Japan. Uh, they wanted me to do a uh, chapter on stomach cancer because in Japan, it's actually a leading killer, stomach cancer, and it wasn't in my top 15. It actually is in the top 15. Um, and that's the whole point of the first half of my book, is talking about the world diet and plant preventing arrest and reversing each of our top 15 killers. So I wrote a special stomach uh, cancer chapter. Uh, and then Sweden said, you can't just go around willy-nilly telling people to eat ground flax seeds. Um, uh, and so would you pretty please add like a little box or blurb, you know, explaining why the Swedish government is just wrong, wrong, wrong. And I said, sure. And so it's in the book. I don't remember what I said, but if you have the book, just look at the little flax chapter, and I talk about, uh, if I remember correctly, it was like some letter in the Lancet published decades ago that um, raised the theoretical possibility, but that was before it was put to the test. And in fact, you can eat huge amounts of flax seeds, way more than my you know, daily dozen recommendation. And why would you want to eat ground flax seeds? I talk about in the book. There are double blind, randomized, placebo controlled studies that show that uh, a few spoonfuls of flax seeds can reduce your blood pressure better than the leading blood pressure medications out there. Um, uh, yeah, reducing cholesterol, blood, high blood sugar, triglycerides, uh, you know, curing constipation, reducing inflammation, all sorts of amazing things. Recommend one tablespoon of ground flax seeds every day, even if you have to smuggle it over the border. <laughs> okay, uh, for one uh, with diabetes. Um, the consequent uh, intramyocellular lipids in the cell causing insulin resistance. Is there a specific thing you can do besides uh, switching to these diets? Uh, specific uh, 
So is there other okay, so other than a plant-based diet, is there anything else I can do to reverse my type 2 diabetes because I don't want to eat anything different? Uh, uh, oh, is there anything specifically? Um, uh, yeah, so legumes, so beans, split threes, two threes, and lentils have, so before there was insulin, um, before there was pharmacological insulin, actually beans was one of the treatments for this was type 1 diabetes, um, which was a death sentence before we actually developed uh, insulin. Um, and so you can look back during the times they were using plants to try to, to, to forestall the horrible consequences of the disease. So, um, uh, so yeah, the, so beans have this kind of starch blocking effect. A bunch of different things have the second meal effect or the fiber and resistant starch, all sorts of good things. So a huge amounts of uh, legumes would be an excellent addition uh, to one's uh, um, diet. Though, uh, as you mentioned, it's a, uh, the cause of, of type 2 diabetes is insulin resistance that's caused by you know, saturated fat stuck in the muscle cells. And the way you get rid of that uh, is you cut down your consumption of saturated fat, um, uh, lose weight if you have uh, too much weight, particularly abdominal weight, uh, uh, and uh, and uh, the diabetes should go away. In fact, that's what happened in most of the cases within a relatively rapid amount of time. And so the, it's critically important that you do this if you are on insulin, um, to do this with your under physician supervision because people can get so bad, or so much better, so quickly it can get dangerous. So if you're on a high dose insulin and all of a sudden you get rid of your diabetes, you can't stay on the same high level insulin, you'll, you know, I like get, panic calls in the middle of the night um, from emergency departments because they wake up in a sweat because their blood sugars drop too low because all of a sudden their disease is getting better and taking the same amount of drugs. So your doctor has to wean you off blood pressure medications and blood sugar medications. Um, and so if you're on any of those classes of medications, you have to do it under physician supervision because otherwise you can get healthy too quickly and it can be dangerous. <laughs> True? Yes, sir, uh, Dr. Greger, my name is Gina. I have a question about mushrooms. Uh, since reading or uh, watching uh, your video about mushrooms, I eagerly awaited the season here when there would be lots of porcinis in the forest, as there uh, sometimes are. Ooh. And uh, this has been a great season this year. And I was out picking them and drying them, but then it suddenly occurred to me, what about heavy metal contamination and radiological contamination? Uh, we were right in the path of the Chernobyl cloud, for example. Mm. Uh, what do you say about the trade-offs between getting the healthy benefits from uh, Puccini's versus the radiological and heavy metal contamination danger? And related to that, uh, I read that uh, mushrooms are resistant to heavy metals because they chelate the heavy metals. Does that make it bio-unavailable when you eat them or not? No, so um, uh, the, one of the reasons we love mushrooms so much is they're so good at sucking trace minerals out of the soil. Um, and so they can be a great source of trace minerals. Um, and so you want to grow your mushrooms in safe soil. If you grow your mushrooms in safe soil, then, then, then there's nothing bad that the mushrooms can take up. So you do not want to grow mushrooms on a toxic waste dump um, or, you know, in a Fukushima, you know. Zone. So, but I don't, I don't know what uh, the, the soil quality is around here. I don't know what, uh, how much you're dosed with Chernobyl. I assume there's a way you can get your soil tested. I know in the States, if you can send off your water, you can send off a soil sample, and they check for lead, um, which is a, a huge problem. Um, and so you make sure that the, your garden vegetables, I mean, who wouldn't want, you want local, I'm literally like 10 feet, right? that's, that's local. Um, but you don't want to be growing something. Now, if it is a problem, then you can do like garden boxes and things with clean soil and stuff. But how wonderful to be able to forage. Um, in fact, we, I was just, yesterday we were uh, biking around that beautiful garden island. And, you know, I was just picking apples and pears. And it was a beautiful thing. Um, but now you tell me they're radioactive. I don't know. <laughs> You're not glowing yet. <laughs> Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Robert. Uh, you cite quite a few older studies that are more than 60 years old. Uh, for instance, the ones comparing African natives to America, uh, Europeans. Uh, have any of these studies been verified and retested in modern times, and what were the results? Fantastic question. The reason I 
talk, use some of these ancients, like 1920s, 1930s, is to show that's how long we've known this. Like, isn't it amazing? This is not love, some like cutting edge science. We've known this literally for decades, for a half century, and it's a travesty of justice that we don't know this, that I wasn't taught this in medical school. He said, wait a second, well, yeah, but, but now we, I don't know, uh, I mean, what about more recent studies? What's nice is that now we have interventional studies. Back then, these were population studies, and you can't prove cause and effect. Um, the, so you need the gold standard in nutritional science, which is a placebo-controlled interventional trial where you actually split people up in two groups, do what's called a metabolic ward study, you lock people in a room, um, and, you, and you have complete 100% control over their diet. And then you can see exactly what happens when you add or subtract foods from their diet. Um, and uh, so, you know, so for example, there were these populations, like in Uganda, you know, where there was an epidemic heart disease. In fact, they couldn't find, in, in you know, these populations of millions of people, they couldn't even find cases of, of, uh, of, uh, of ischemic heart disease. Um, and so Pritikin said, wow, well, let's put people on the same, let's put people with heart disease on the same kind of diets. Uh, they're followed by people that don't get heart disease, maybe we'll slow the disease down. Boom, a miracle happened. Disease actually got better. So that was the interventional site proving that, ah, there was, that it was the diet that was the problem. Um, but that was not a, first of all, it wasn't a, a randomized control study. You didn't have people that didn't go on the diet. Maybe they just would have miraculously, their heart disease got better spontaneously. And um, uh, the, uh, the, we didn't have angiographic evidence. So people, like my grandmother, were in a wheelchair because they had crushing chest pain. And then all of a sudden they're walking 10 miles a day and a critic could be like, yeah, maybe you really didn't have heart disease. Or maybe, I mean, you couldn't say that in case my mom, because she, grandma, because she had all this open heart surgery. But, uh, you know, someone who cl claimed they had chest pain and all of a sudden their chest pain went away. You're, you, it's a subjective kind of thing. So what Ornish did was the same thing. Pritikin was reversing thousands of, of cases of heart disease. So what Ornish did, first of all, he randomized people into, into a control group, which were told to follow the advice of your physician. Right? And they, of course, got worse. Um, and then his group, was the, the, that lifestyle group, would put people on a plant-based diet. Um, and they did, they did angiograms, where you do a special dye and take x-rays of people's chest, and you actually see um, the, 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 how, how much the openings of their arteries, and you could actually show reversal. You can show those plaques disappearing, dissolving away, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery. So, yes, we have these ancient studies looking at populations, observational data, but what we have with the revolution is we have interventional studies, randomized controlled studies, we have the gold standard in terms of proving that, ah, indeed, um, it wasn't just a correlation, but actually causation. The diet and lifestyle led to these diseases. And of course, beyond Ornish Esselstyn um, at the Cleveland Clinic said, well, forget the stress management, the exercise, and all the other things Ornish did. Um, what about just changing people's diet to a whole food plant-based diet and saw those same dramatic reversals proving that indeed it's the food. Hi. My name is Liana, and um, I've been vegetarian for several years now, and vegan for several months. And I'm wondering about um, pregnancy and kids. And uh, like I saw, I didn't have time to study all the materials yet in the book, but I saw that you have some materials on the website saying that yeah, it's safe to be, to go pregnant, being vegan, and like for the kids and everything. But is there any minimum period of, I don't know, some time giving your body to adapt to a new diet? And like, should one look after a vegan-friendly physician to be guiding the pregnancy? And then how safe is it like for the small kids, not teenagers, but like, I don't know, babies and everything? What should one consider when thinking about that? Thank you. Thank you for that question. So um, the most esteemed pediatrician of all time, Dr. Benjamin Spock, who wrote the the book Child and Baby Care, the second best-selling book in, in English, in history, second only to the Bible. Um, in his seventh edition, um, which he wrote it when he was age 94, the last edition he uh, contributed to, um, he recommended all children be raised, zero exposure to meat and dairy. Um, and indeed, 
the largest and oldest association of nutrition professionals in the world, the American Dietetic Association. Um, you can look at any of their uh, position statements. The last one came out last year, um, December uh, 2016, it said that um, strictly plant-based diets are appropriate for all stages of lifestyle, pregnancy, infancy, small children, all the way up to the elderly, and indeed has benefits. Um, so it's not just kind of neutral, but actually has benefits. And for, as we can see, the childhood obesity epidemic, and it's no surprise that eating healthy would be good for you. Having said that, like any um, diet, it's critical during pregnancy to eat particularly healthy. Um, and there are the, the biggest difference between a vegan pregnancy um, and a non-vegan pregnancy, well, first of all, there's lower rates of preeclampsia, there's all sorts of, and there's, um, um, uh, five times lower rates of twins, which is actually good because twins are risky pregnancies. Um, uh, and that's because there's less dairy hormone exposure probably. Um, but so healthier pregnancy, blah, blah, but critical, vitamin B12. There are two vitamins that are not made by plants. One is vitamin D, which is made by animals such as yourselves when you walk outside and get some sunshine. However, some people, live in Sweden, <laughs> and uh, during the winter months, the sun's rays are at such an angle that it doesn't matter how much you sunbathe naked in February, you are not going to make enough vitamin D. Um, and so, at least during the winter months, and year-round, if you're not getting enough midday sun on enough exposed skin, I recommend people take 2,000 international units of vitamin D every day. Um, and the only other vitamin not made by plants is vitamin B12, not made by animals either, made by little microbes that blanket the earth. So, you know, we may, we may have been able to get all the B12 we need drinking out of a mountain stream or well water or something, but now we chlorinate the water supply to kill off any bacteria. So we don't get a lot of B12 in our tap water anymore. We don't get a lot of cholera either. That's a good thing. <laughs> that we live in such a nice sanitary world, but because we do, we need to get a regular, reliable source of B12 from somewhere. Our fellow great apes get all the B12 they need eating bugs, dirt, and feces. I prefer supplements. <laughs> um, uh, so probably the easiest way is one 2,500 microgram supplement of cyanocobalamin uh, once a week, um, uh, at least in the States. It's less than five bucks a year. Get all the B12 you need. Um, or you can get B, or you can eat B12 fortified foods or some soy milks and things that have B12 um, added to them. Probably easier to do supplements. The reason it's critical for pregnancy um, and uh, and during breastfeeding is because as adults, if we all of a sudden start eating healthy, we have B12 stored up in our liver um, uh, that can last months or even years before we run into problems. But the baby, if the mother isn't supplementing with B12, the baby starts out with nothing and can very rapidly develop life-threatening vitamin B12 deficiency, absolutely critical, that particularly for pregnant breastfeeding women, but everybody eating a healthy diet needs to ensure a regular, reliable source of vitamin B12. I'm so glad you brought that up. Hello. I am here. The sophistic arm map. My name is Patrick. Thank you for your talk. Um, I have a question. If you could expand a little bit on vitamin K2. There are two types of vitamin K. Vitamin K is critical for um, uh, lots of stuff, including blood clotting. Vitamin K1 is found in my favorite food, the healthiest food on the planet. Dark green leafy vegetables, packed with uh, K1, and your good bacteria can turn K1 into K2, so you have all the K1 and K2 that you care to eat, um, and so you don't have to worry about K2 as long as you're eating your greens, um, and you're not taking lots of antibiotics every day, and wiping out your good gut flora. So eat your greens, yet another reason to eat your greens, on top of all the other wonderful reasons. These poor people in the back, they never crack it. All right. <laughs> uh, my name is Joanna. I want to thank you for coming here. Uh, we follow your channel and I've read your book. Oh, great. And uh, I recommend it to uh, everyone, basically, I think. <laughs> <laughs>
Just the people you care about. <laughs> Everybody else, eat bacon. Everybody. I actually have one small question, like follow-up question from one of the earlier ones, and uh -huh. then uh, another question. Um, um, the first question I think was about flax seeds. Yeah. Ground flax seeds. Yeah. And I. Just I want to remember that the reason we shouldn't eat it, according to Swedish authorities, was... Cyanide! Yes, exactly. Because of cyanide. <laughs> well, cyanide? What's the problem with that? Yeah. Cyanide. Cyanide. The, 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 amount of, the amount of cyanide that we get into our bodies by eating ground flaxseed, uh -huh. um, if we want to explain the minimal effect it has on us and the minimal amount of cyanide, Yep. Uh, what could we compare it to, like for a very striking argument? Um, do, do I not say that in the book? What do I say in the book about flax seeds? <coughs> I don't remember. Someone got the book. Someone just wanted, should we read the, I don't know, how many, how many lines could there be? Anybody got the book? Who's got the book? Alright, whip it up. Och livsmedelsverket anser att det inte finns tillräckligt med underlag för att styrka att intag av madalinfrön är säkert. Eh, Michael Greger hänvisar emellertid till forskning som visat att upp till 100 gram, cirka 12 matskedar, eh, madalinfrön per dag är säkra att inta. Här kan du ladda ner på en pdf <här> Uh, 12 tablespoons a day. 12 tablespoons a day. So is that like the max or what? What's yeah. 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 So don't eat more than 12 tablespoons of raw ground flax seeds a day. <laughs> All right. Okay. Don't eat more than 12. Yeah. I just want to tell you, I still have some left down here. And oh, so okay. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. Oh, me. Oh, but uh, yeah, but did I did I say like eating this many apples is as much getting as much cyanide or this many almonds or macadamia nuts in terms of that that argument? I don't know. Did I say anything like that? Uh, the, the question was, um, what can you compare the amount of? Oh right, right, and so right, so yeah, cyanide is found in all sorts of plant foods like. Apples have cyanide, and peaches have cyanide, and almonds and macadamia nuts. And so I was wondering, yeah, is it like there's no more cyanide in potatoes with ground flax seeds as X many apples? Uh, did I not say that in that little thing that you just said? <laughs> oh, you didn't read the Swedish edition, but did it say anything? No. I don't, no, no. I don't know what I said. In oh, well, I mean, I could, yeah, I mean, if people really... I mean, yeah, I mean, you can look at the, 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 at the study that was done. Um, and would be happy to, I'd be happy to look up the, the apple values. But I mean, because we're regularly exposed to small amounts of cyanide, our body has this detoxification mechanism, and it's only when we, you know, make, uh, make a World War I, you know, gas that, uh, you know, or, or in the States, we execute people with it, but uh, yeah. Don't do that either. Yeah, yeah. hi there. Hey, uh, my name is Anna, we spoke outside before. Um, and I said I would prepare some geeky questions, so here you go. Um, we were, me and yeah, Nick, my boyfriend, we were talking about the video you recently put out about um, like high fat, high protein, plant-based foods like tofu and that you shouldn't cook it like uh, on high temperatures. Uh, I feel like uh, I need a little bit of clarification in that because I love putting seeds on everything and putting it in the oven and, oh, yeah, yeah. and frying tofu in, you know, water and miso in a pan, that's just everything. So I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> if you could be a bit more specific on how do I cook tofu, is there any other way than steaming or what can I do with seeds and things like that? Yeah, so um, AGEs, Advanced Glycation End Products, these so-called glycotoxins, are these toxic compounds created when high fat, high protein foods are exposed to high dry heat. So we're talking frying, broiling, barbecuing, baking, um, toasting, anything, hydro, okay. At, at that high temperature, these, these, these glycotoxins are created, they're bad for you. And so, and I talk about in the book, I have a list of like the top 20 sources of glycotoxins. One is like, broiled hot dogs, and then it just goes down and it's like, you know, pork, pork, chicken, fish, pork, chicken, fish, beef, you know, uh, for, okay, but, um, uh, so a, a, a larger updated database was since published, 
that, and you know, it really should come to no surprise, there are a few high fat, high protein, whole plant foods. Um, so for example, nuts. So in, I don't know if I caught it in time, I, I don't think I did. So in the book, I talk about how I love toasted walnuts. I just love the flavor of toasted sesame seeds, whatever. Um, and that's actually a bad idea. Now we know, we didn't know. Uh, that's the nice thing about doing all my work online, because I can go back and redo the video. It's hard to redo the book. But um, the, uh, so when you roast nuts, right, that's a high fat, high protein food exposed to high dry to heat and creates these glycotoxins. Um, at uh, levels comparable to what one might get, uh, you know, frying a hamburger or something. So, um, uh, so I encourage people to not roast their nuts and seeds to buy raw peanut butter, almond butter, whatever, and eat your nuts raw rather than roasted. Um, and uh, and so the uh, and and the other kind of food um, that was that was listed is um, uh, the the grilled tofu. Tofu, high fat, high protein. Food, and when you grill it, um, you're exposed to high heat and you create these glycotoxins. So, you want to stick to moist heating methods. So, that's boiling, steaming, anything where the temperature just can't, there's a limit to the temperature you can get so high because the water absorbs the, the temperature. So, you can steam your tofu, you can, um, you can boil it in soup, uh, but you shouldn't be frying your tofu. Or look, I mean, it doesn't matter what you eat on your birthday, or special occasions, or holidays. It's the day-to-day -day stuff that really adds up. So on a, but on a day-to-day -day basis, you really should not be eating like, you know, fried or, or broiled tofu. <laughs> My name is Marie. Thank you very much for doing everything you do. Um, my question is regarding fat. Um, uh, it's a hype. I don't know if it's a hype, but there's a lot about coconut oil, but also bone broth. I don't oh. know if it's like swearing in the church to mention bone broth, <laughs> but it'll be very interesting to hear about the research and your opinion. Thank yeah, you. yeah. So I have no opinion about anything, but I can tell you what the science says. And the science says that coconut oil, so you can do these metabolic rewards studies where you feed people coconut oil, their LDL, their bad cholesterol goes up. And, and you can, if you want to see the studies, I've got these new videos on coconut oil that shows that you eat coconut oil, you all deal, bad cholesterol goes up, which is kind of a primary risk factor, mainstream risk factor for our number one killer of Swedish men and women. So you don't eat coconut oil, or you eat, certainly not, not on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't want to have any coconut oil in your diet. And, uh, the, and I have one video about bone broth, and basically it just talks about the, the lead level. So when we... Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the half-life of lead in the human body is actually very short, 30 days. 30 days, your body gets rid of half uh, the lead. So in a couple months, you're basically 98% of the lead that you're exposed to is gone. Uh, the problem is gone where? And you know where it goes? It goes to your skeleton. It gets locked away in your bones, which is fine until you lose bone mass during pregnancy. Uh, during osteoporosis, even menopause period, you, you, you start losing bone and your blood lead levels go up um, uh, and that's not a good thing. Um, and so many of us were exposed to lead and gasoline, you know, back, you know, in the 70s or before. Um, it's all locked away in our skeleton, just ready to be released back into our bloodstream and cause all sorts of havoc. Um, and so researchers said, well, wait a second. What about all these bone broth people who are literally like intentionally boiling bones in water? And so they did the test and they used free range organic chicken um, and found, I forget the lead levels, but they were um, uh, significantly higher than one would expect. Um, and so that's probably the, 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 the biggest downside of bone broth is just because it releases uh, toxic metals into the broth. But again, it's a matter of how much you exposed to, uh, but it's not something I need on a day-to-day -day basis. Hi, my name is Kenela. I was wondering a little about depression. You haven't mentioned so much about depression and plant advice. Yeah, so um, just that University of Arizona study that found that cutting down on uh, eggs, chicken, and other meat significantly improves mood um, within two weeks. Now that was not done with people with depression.
These are people who, who like just normal people and they just got happy. So they went from normal to happy. What we'd like is from depressed to at least normal. That would be where, I mean, you know, people that are um, at serious risk or major depression. And those studies have simply not been done. Um, and so the best we have is, well, uh, look, it improves mood in this group of people. Maybe it'll improve mood in this, but it's just not, not something that's been put to the test. And I think that's unfortunate. But as soon as the study is published like that, I'll do a video about it and get it out to the world. Um, there should be like a little iPad going around. You can sign up to the, you know, email and you, you'll be, I will let you know when all the new videos are out. Hello? Yes, uh, my name is Mary. I'm here. You're so I would like to. Do you see me? <laughs> it doesn't matter. I mean, hey, I'm okay. I, you're, <laughs> you're in the void. It, it, yes. I'm here. It doesn't matter. I just wanted to know your opinion about gluten. Do you have anything to say about that? I do. I can, again, I, it's not something, you know, I, it is, so, something as life and death important as what to feed ourselves and our family. There, there should be no role for belief systems or zealotry or dogma or opinion, right? If there's anything in life we should make, any decisions in life we should make based on evidence, it should be health and well-being of our family. So, I no opinion, but I can tell you what the science says about gluten. So just like, um, you know, some people, rare people, have a peanut allergy, and they eat a peanut and drop dead. And you say, oh my God, peanuts. Look at that, right? Okay, now, just because peanuts are bad for that person, in fact, really bad for that person, doesn't mean peanuts in general are bad for everybody. And the same thing with gluten. So one in a thousand people have a wheat allergy, um, about one in 140 people have something called celiac disease, which is a serious autoimmune disease triggered by gluten. And they have to stay off gluten their entire lives, strictly. And then the new entity, which is why you hear lots about gluten, is a non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which our best estimates are about 1% of the population. So 1% of the population has a non-gluten, a non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So basically, um, for about 2%, about 1 in 50 people, um, it's better that they stay away from gluten, but for 98% of people, um, then gluten is just like any other good uh, plant protein. We should continue to include um, you know, barley, uh, wheat, and rye in our um, daily diet. So, um, but not good for those uh, 2%. Thank you. I just want to say, this is Martin, and you have a question, but also for everybody, he will actually put this uh, recording from this evening on the internet. So I will send it in the thank you letter for everybody, a link. So there's a lot of information and uh, you'll have everything from Martin. Great. And this is the question. Yeah, so uh, I saw on Facebook uh, a person who is a vegan and she studies nutrition. And she says about your work that, yeah, we love that he brings up uh, that we should eat more plants, but uh, and you maybe have heard this because you talked about cherry picking. That he is cherry picking. He's, he takes all the studies that support his uh, claims about the plant-based foods, but he's uh, exaggerating the results. Uh, so my question is, why do you think you get this criticism, and uh, what's your answer to it? The answer is there's only one diet ever been proven to reverse heart disease, number one killer of Swedish men and women. Only one ever. Now, maybe someday some new diet will pass the test, but right now, this is the best we have. It's not cherry picking, there's only one diet, right? So there's only one diet ever been proven to um, you know, treat multiple sclerosis better than any other medical intervention, better than any drug, any intervention that's a plant-based diet. The best diet, the best intervention ever for Crohn's disease, not autoimmune disease, and is a plant-based diet. No other diet has come close to that. It's not cherry picking, it's show me the study. Show me the study, show me some other diet that can improve mood in two weeks or improve mood in any number of weeks in a randomized control trial. They don't exist. These they, People envision these cherries everywhere. But I mean, this is all I do. So, so the answer is not accuse me of cherry picking. It's like, what about this study? Show me a study. So that's my challenge. Show me a study that, you know, even, so show, even better, show me a meta-analysis. So that's like all the studies put together, right? Um, 
that say, no, what I'm saying is not true, or there's, there's, there's another diet that does it better. I mean, I'm, I'd love to learn, I'd love to share it, I'd love to send it around. Um, so why um, do you get that criticism? The only diet ever to reverse the progression of cancer um, was Ornish's, but I mean, no other diet ever, then or since, right? I mean, come on. <laughs> But, I mean, Hi, my name is Marcus, and I have a question about GMOs. What's your take on GMOs? Um, uh, so, I, uh, so you type in GMO and nutritionfacts.org, all my videos will come up. Um, the biggest concern is the uh, higher levels of pesticide residues. So the whole point of genetically modifying a soybean to resist um, Monsanto's pesticides so they can dump more pesticide on it. So, um, you know, typically you can only, uh, we're talking about herbicides, so right, they kill off weeds. Well, you can't put an herbicide on a crop because it will kill the crop because it's a plant too. So you can only dump herbicides between crops, between plantings, but unless you genetically modify the plant to resist your herbicide, then you can dump on it all day long, kills off all the weeds in your plant stands, and that's GMO soy. And so, not surprisingly, if you actually pick some GMO soybeans, um, at, the, at the supermarket, you can't really, mostly it goes to the livestock feed. Most um, <coughs> soy fed to people is organic and it doesn't have GMO by definition. But you, when you go to the feed store and pick up some G, uh, GMO soy, it actually has higher levels of glyphosate of this, of this herbicide than either conventional soy or organic soy, conventional non-GMO soy. Um, and so then the question becomes, how toxic is this herbicide and what's the level? And I talk about the controversy surrounding that. But there's no data suggesting harm from the genetic construct itself for human beings. Like there's a, so it's not that it was genetically modified, but it's the consequence that you can dump more pesticides on it that appears to be the only human health risk that has since been demonstrated, as far as I know. Hi, my name is Varo, and I have a question for you. Um, are there any studies that you know that on muscle pain related to your diet, and uh, like knee pain, lumbar pain, and inflammation in the body, like fibromyalgia, stuff like that? Uh, yeah, so I've got a bunch of videos on, oh, yeah, so the only diet ever to, uh, <laughs> in fact, the, 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 the classic rheumatoid arthritis study was done here in Sweden, this famous study, um, put people on a plant-based diet for a year, saw these remarkable benefits for rheumatoid arthritis. Um, no other diet has been shown um, to have those benefits. I mean, there's a plant-based diet, it's the only diet um, to, in terms of uh, these inflammatory arthritis. Uh, arthritis. So I talk about rheumatoid arthritis, I talk about gout, um, again, the plant-based diet. Um, uh, uh, I talk about osteoarthritis, I've got videos on that. Um, in terms of fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, there's less out there. Uh, I have a few videos. I forget what the videos say. That's the nice thing, you put them online, and then you move on to the next stuff. But uh, if you just type in fibromyalgia, it should pop right up. Uh, I forget. There's, I mean, I wouldn't have done a video about it if there was like nothing. I wouldn't be like, and it's this horrible disease, and there's nothing we can do about it. Next! <laughs> I, mean, uh, I must have found something that at least offered some glimmer of hope, so just gotta check it out. Hello. Uh, I would like to know about hyperthyroiditis, and I got that diagnosed, and I refuse to do as the doctors say, and I think that you would help me. So hyper, overactive thyroid. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so um, the Adventist 2 study, the largest study of plant-based eaters in human history, um, which has 4,000 vegans, but you know, that should be humbling that the largest study of vegans ever only has 4,000 people, I mean 4,000 vegans, compared to tens of thousands of other lactos and et cetera, but um, found that um, those eating plant-based diets had significantly lower levels of hyperthyroidism, so uh, significantly more likely to have a, a, a normal uh, thyroid gland, which is nice, but that's in terms of prevention. In terms of treatment, um, uh, that I know of Unless it's a very rare circumstance in which you have um, thyrotoxicosis due to iodine overload. So if you were eating kelp, 
If you're eating lots of kelp, then there's a dietary intervention to cure your hyperthyroidism. It's called stop eating kelp. Um, but if your hyperthyroidism is uh, some of the more typical non-dietary um, related, um, uh, then, then you should uh, strongly consider taking your physician's advice. Um, and usually involves kind of a blading um, part of the thyroid to, uh, to knock down its uh, uh, thyroid hormone production. Hi, good, thank you. Here. Uh, my question is about scientific articles. Um, we are not doctors. Uh, do you have any kind of specific tips that we can use in order to be able to discern between reliable and biased articles? Ah, oh, what a great question. <laughs> Such a good question that I have been designing yeah, this whole series um, uh, this webinar series on how to read a research article. So I did one research. I was how to, I had a basically how to do research, um, it, where to find articles, um, uh, how to search for articles, and then my next webinar was going to be on how to read a research article, and that's exactly um, uh, what I wanted to cover. And uh, so, um, so uh, basically. Um, Talking about conflicts of interest within, you know, how to dig in and find out uh, they, they, uh, where the researchers getting their grant monies from, both <coughs> currently and historically, and talking about some of the some of the slimy, underhanded study design um, uh, 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 techniques used by corporate interests to try to skew the results. It's going to be absolutely fascinating. I'm really looking forward to it. Unfortunately, I just signed. Contract for the next book, Manuscripts Due March 2019. It'll be out December 2019. Uh, but that puts me on a kind of a tight schedule. So there was two big webinars I wanted to do. Um, uh, six hours on fasting and intermittent fasting ketogenic diets, and then this four-hour one on, on how to read a research article. And I'm afraid they might get bumped or at least delayed because I got to start in the next book. So no I know, I know. Oh. Um, so, see, but the, pro see, the problem is they want to they have the most come out during the holiday season, like, you know, December and January, like New Year, New You kind of thing. And so that's why if, if I don't get it out, if they don't have it in a certain time, then they book, bump it a whole other year. And I don't want the book to come out in 2021. Ugh. So, um, so, yeah. Uh, oh my God! I got so much good stuff. Let me show you. Do I, does this? Uh, uh, my projector still working here? Um, let me show you. Oh my God! Such good stuff. Here it is. Oh, there we go. All right. Let me pull up my medical journal. Do, 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 do. Oh, is it not here? So here. So I have. So let's see what here. I should have. Um, so I've got sixty thousand. Um, Oh no, 72,000 articles here. Um, and um, here we go. Whoa, this is good stuff. Medical journals, yeah, here we go. So these are, these are all the awesome, cool topics you would have heard about um, had I been able to, I don't know. But I'm working on it. I'm really hoping to get to do this before. Oh my God, such good stuff. Uh, Deception, fraud, misconduct. That's a lot of art. Look at this. Oh, this is all the big pharma stuff. Oh my God, they do so much slimy stuff. Ah! Oh, it's killing me. It's absolutely killing me. Oh, oh use of graphics. Oh, that's got some cool. All right, never mind. All right, I'm working on it. I'm trying my best. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Jonathan. Uh, a few years ago, my mom was diagnosed with uh, carcinoidic uh, cancer, yeah. the same cancer that they reckon killed Steve Jobs. And uh, the, the thing about it is that uh, she's undergone both radiation treatments and uh, amputation of the lower intestines and stuff. And which has left her uh, completely unable to digest certain types of fiber, which includes leafy greens and starchy vegetables and yep. stuff. And I was wondering, do you know if there's any studies um, who are showing benefits of a plant-based diet towards this type of cancer? 
Uh, there are no studies on carcinoid tumors in diet that I'm aware of. However, um, I haven't looked for a while. If you go to pubmed.gov, P-U-B-M-E-D dot G-O-V, that's the database of the largest medical library in the world, which is biking distance from my house. This is where I live in D.C. Um, because I have access to this amazing library. And so that is, so if it exists anywhere, it exists there. And you type in carcinoid, and you type in diet, nutrition, and it should pop up. And if there's anything new, let me know. I'll grab the article, find it for you, and, and, if, and if it's something that's, that's, uh, that's exciting, I'll, I'll do a video about it. Um, I, in terms of uh, just, just at this point, in terms of nutrition, um, uh, blending is probably the best. So I recommend investing in a, in a good high-speed blender, um, and that's a way you can pack in lots of nutrition without running into issues with uh, intestinal blockage and things with just kind of high-fiber foods. Mm -hmm. Hi, a common food in the Swedish cuisine is the white potato. Uh, what are your general views on that food? Is it a good well, food? What about white potatoes? Anytime you, you, the question comes up, is food X healthy? Is white potatoes healthy? Are eggs healthy? The, 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 the only answer is compared to what? So, are eggs healthy? Well, compared to breakfast sausage next to it, the, yeah, compared to oatmeal, not even close, right? Are white potatoes healthy? Compared to Twinkies, absolutely. <laughs> compared to sweet potatoes, no. Sweet potatoes are healthier. And so every time you eat, you chew into a white potato, you just lost out on an opportunity to chew into a sweet potato, which is healthy, right? It's like, it's like, it's like, um, it's like coffee. Every cup of coffee is a lost opportunity to drink a cup of green tea, which is even healthier, right? Now, coffee is a health-promoting beverage, as I talk about my Parkinson's chapter, the mental health chapter, and the liver disease chapter, but green tea is healthier. So every time you drink, right, we only have a certain amount of, uh, you know, of food we can eat every day. So food is a zero-sum game. There's an opportunity cost. Every time we eat something, it's a lost opportunity to eat something healthier. So is, are white potatoes bad? Well, compared to sweet potatoes, yeah. But compared to a lot of other foods, white potatoes are great. Um, but basically, anything you can do with white potato, you can do with a sweet potato. Um, and so that's what I would encourage you to do. So instead of a baked white potato, you have a baked sweet potato. Um, uh, yeah, so... Um, so sweet potatoes, are, sweet potatoes are actually one of the healthiest foods on the planet. Um, and uh, yeah, so to try to find ways to get those into your diet. Uh, hi. How do you cook this? Um, what do you think about um, eating uh, raw vegan and mostly fruits? Do you eat too much fruit and what about the sugar? Ah, great questions. Um, there was a quick one up front about how do you cook sweet potatoes. I actually have a video called, What's the Best Way to Cook Sweet Potatoes? Right? <laughs> Literally, that's the name of the video. And you know, it's ironic. It's like one of the most popular videos on nutrition facts. Like I do like the metrics. They're like, what are people interested in? Breast cancer? Are they, you know, I have all these, oh, I'm sure that, oh, that's a great, that was a funny video. No, it's how to cook sweet potatoes. <laughs> Because I guess it's like a common Google question or something, and so it just, anyway, anyway. So I put all this work into this, all this other stuff, and it's a stupid sweet potato video that gets all the millions of views. Um, oh, I, I don't even remember what the video said. It's uh, st boiling, right? Was not boiling? I don't know. Someone out there knows nutrition facts better than I do. I think it's boiling. Boiling was the healthiest way to eat sweet potatoes, which is surprising, right? Anyway. Um, oh, okay, raw vegan. Um, so I don't. So the benefits of uh, of eating raw is that it, by kind of definition, cuts out processed foods. And so when people, so when someone comes to me and says they're vegan, as a physician, that's not very helpful. That doesn't. That tells me what you don't eat, but it doesn't tell me what you do eat, right? Um, so like you know, Coca Cola, vegan. Right? Yeah. Right, potato chips, vegan, right? I mean, like, you can eat a horrible diet and be vegan. Now you can get vegan donuts and vegan, I mean, you can, like, and so, you know, that's why I prefer, you know, whole food, plant-based nutrition. Oh, you actually eat your vegetables. Oh, okay, you actually eat healthy food. That tells me something. Um, and so, 
So that's why, so at least when you say robbing, oh, okay, you're actually eating salads, you're actually, okay, you're probably actually eating real food as opposed to this kind of junky stuff. Um, but in terms of long, but there's no benefit um, that, uh, that can be demonstrated of long-term uh, raw vegan over just whole food plant-based. So a, a non-processed food, that, you know, centered around both raw and cooked um, uh, uh, plant foods. And that's because it's not what we eat, it's what we absorb. And there are some uh, heat-sensitive nutrients like folate and vitamin C that are partially destroyed by cooking. Um, but um, other nutrients like carotenoid phytonutrients um, actually are boosted. The absorption is greatly enhanced. So you get like, you know, five times more beta carotene in your bloodstream after eating cooked carrots and the same amount of raw carrots. Same, you know, more lycopene, this red pigment in tomatoes when you eat uh, processed tomato products like tomato sauce than if you eat actually raw tomatoes. Um, and uh, so when they looked at very few studies done on long-term raw vegans, but these famous Hallelujah studies, um, these, the so-called Hallelujah diet, where they had these people that for years were on raw vegan diets, and they actually did really poorly in terms of long-term health. Nutrient deficiency is really low, like beta carotene levels in the blood, which is crazy, because all they're eating is eating, you know, doing is eating fruit and vegetables every day, but, um, but they're just not absorbing as much as they should be. So. Um, I encourage people to eat a combination of raw and cooked foods, but what the raw food is can, show, can really tell us, and we, we can learn from them, is these big salads, these massive salads. I mean, those, you know, those big mixing bowls? Like, that's your salad, but like, get your own salad, right? Like, you know, that, I mean, that's the way we really got, you know, but, you know, you should add some, like, canned beans on top, and nuts and seeds, okay. So, um, uh, so, yeah, so we can certainly learn a lot from the movement. But, uh, but eating uh, completely raw, um, the literature really has, has frowned upon it in the long term, uh, on a long term basis, though certainly staying away from processed foods is a good idea. Uh, in terms of fruit, um, you know, well, you know, we know, you know, sugar, industrial sugars, high fructose corn syrup, table sugar, sucrose, bad for us. Uh, we're learning more and more, it's not just neutral empty cows, it's actually bad for us in terms of increasing fat in our liver and increasing our blood pressure and all sorts of bad things. Um, and so, well, wait a second, what about the sugar in fruit? I mean, if you eat enough fruit, you'd get the same kind of fructose levels that you would get drinking soda or something. So, um, researchers decided to put it to the test. This is at David Jenkins' lab at the University of Toronto. He's the guy that invented the glycemic index. He wanted to really put it, so he had people eat more than 20 servings of fruits a day, right? And to get it up to like, I think it was like two liters of Coke worth of fructose a day, right? So massive amounts of sugar, but all in whole fruit form. And he wanted to see if there'd be negative, if there's any kind of upper limit. And no, not only did, did was there no deleterious effects, it actually had beneficial effects. So you eat that much fruit, and the reverse happened. You had less fat, you know, but actually your blood pressure went down. It had all these wonderful beneficial effects. In fact, the Global Burden of Disease Study, um, that I talked about a bit, um, uh, found that the number one dietary risk factor for death in the world, you think what, soda consumption, processed meat? No, number one risk factor for death on planet Earth is inadequate fruit consumption. That's killing more people than anything else. We're not eating enough fruit. Um, uh, that, and so, yeah, we should definitely stuff your face with as many fruits and vegetables as possible. Um, and, uh, and the question is why? Well, wait a second. If sugar is bad, then why? Well, how is it any different if it's packaged in fruit form? And originally, we thought it was the fiber. So, for example, if you give people, oh, what was this study? And so I have the, these, uh, a video called How Much Fruit is Too Much Fruit, something like that, um, where they give people a few tablespoons, I think, of sugar in a cup of water, and you drink it. And then what happens is you get this massive spike in your blood sugar, because you have this refined sugar, so high, in fact, that your body releases so much insulin to tamp it down, that you actually become hypoglycemic. Your blood sugars dive so low, you actually dip below than when you were fasting. So here's your fasting before you drank the sugar, and then it goes up so high, it comes dead, crashing down, actually goes, you become hypoglycemic before normalizing out, and your body gets so freaked out that you have below fasting blood sugars, it releases all this fat into the bloodstream, thinking that you're, you're starving or something, and that's this triglycerides, and that leads to all sorts of metabolic problems, so that's bad. You get all this fat in your blood um, eating sugar. Okay, 
So what if you took that same glass, I think it was three tablespoons of sugar, three tablespoons of sugar in that glass of water. What if you ate that same glass of water, three tablespoons of sugar, plus you add an extra tablespoon of sugar, but in berry form. You add berries, a, a puree of berries, enough that is an extra added tablespoon worth of sugar, so a lot of berries, in addition to the three tablespoons. So you just added more sugar, what happens? Does it spike even higher? No. It, it spikes significantly lower, more sugar, but lower, and there's no hypoglycemic dip. It just goes up and down um, without, and no triglycerides in the bloodstream. What is, you, wait a second, what's going on? That originally thought it's the fiber, right? The fiber in fruit, right? The sugar in fruit comes prepackaged with fiber. It must form some kind of gel in the stomach, so it slows the absorption of sugar into the digestive tract. Um, until they did the same study, but with grape juice. They gave people uh, you know, purple grape juice, no fiber whatsoever, so just sugar, and same thing happened. They didn't get that over, the same amount of sugar, but didn't get the big spike, didn't get the hypoglycemia, didn't get the triglycerides, what's going on? And it turns out that the polyphenol phytonutrients, these phytonutrients um, uh, that actually make the, the grape juice purple, um, actually block the absorption of sugar in the small intestine. So it, it slows the absorption actually at, physically at the wall. And so between the fiber and the polyphenols, there's all sorts of reasons why we should eat sugar in the way nature intended in whole food form, otherwise known as fruit. <laughs> Hi, um, I have a question about oil uh, and the fat. Well, um, um, I would like to know how, and then I talk about like olive oil and the oil you get from rapeseeds, <laughs> uh, which we use a lot here in Sweden. How much or how little can my body handle in cooking? Because I think I've seen on your website where you say that you can find traces of it in the blood system short up, shortly after you take in, oh, eat an olive oil. So it's not the oil in the Mediterranean diet that is good, it's the salad. Uh, so again, my question is then, how much or how little can, can my bloodstream or my body handle? Perfect follow-up question, the sugar one, because oil is the table sugar of the fat kingdom, right? So you take something like a sugar beet, which is where we get most sugar from, at least in the States, and then you remove all nutrition, you're left with table sugar, right? Same thing, you take something like a walnut, one of the healthiest possible things we can eat, remove all nutrition, you're left with walnut oil. There's a little vitamin E, a few fat-soluble nutrients, but basically you stripped all the nutrition away. Same thing with olives, stripped the nutrition away, you're left with just the oil. Um, and so, um, and then, so in a very similar way, so uh, originally it was just kind of empty calories, just like table sugar. Yeah, well, it's empty calories, you're getting calories, you're not getting a lot of nutrition. Um, but then we learned, no, actually sugar, when stripped of all that nutrition, actually has negative effects on the body. And the same thing we now know with oil. When we eat the fat set, refined out from the whole plant food, it acts differently in the body. If we eat nuts, all sorts of wonderful things happen. It's one of the few foods associated with literally uh, years added to your lifespan. Um, that cannot be said of many foods. Um, in fact, we have interventional trials, randomized controlled trials, where you give people nuts. You send them, I think it's a half a pound of nuts a week, in the mail. You have meat nuts, and you randomize a group that don't eat nuts. And the group, um, after about four years, had, that got the nuts in the mail, half the stroke rate. Half the stroke, cut the risk of stroke in half, right? Um, which is the second leading killer here in Sweden. So not eating nuts doubles your stroke rate, basically. That's, that's how you can say it. Um, and so you should eat a, a palm full or an ounce of nuts every day. Um, but oil... Um, has negative effects on your artery function. And so even extra virgin olive oil, despite the you know, uh, phytonutrients that you can smell and see in extra virgin olive oil since it's so unprocessed, still you get the same negative effect on, in terms of crippling your artery function, um, uh, uh, preventing them, your arteries from relaxing normally 
in half within hours, the same thing you get when you eat cheesecake and, um, and McDonald's, which was actually the original study by Vogel was with McDonald's uh, sausage and egg McMuffins, but that same clamping down of your artery function by um, taking a big whopping dose of oil. Now having said that, these studies were with a lot of oil. So I did like uh, the, the classic study was with a third of a cup of oil. So they just chugged down a third of a cup of oil, you got these really negative effects on the arteries. And the question is, well, wait a second, what if you just drizzle a little oil? Is it you're going to have those negative effects? We don't know. Studies haven't been done. But certainly, um, uh, the, I mean, it is the most calorically dense food on the planet. One tablespoon, 120 calories. I mean, you know, you, I mean, so you could like double, triple the caloric um, value of a salad by drizzling some oil on top. You dumped, uh, you know, a tablespoon of oil down your throat, you wouldn't even feel any different. But you know what, 120 calories of, of broccoli is a big bowl. 120 calories of strawberries, 120 calories of tomatoes, that's a lot of food. It really fill you up, um, whereas oil is just kind of wasted and at high enough quantities actually has negative effects on arterial function, and that's the leading killers here, is uh, cardiovascular function, heart disease, and uh, strokes. We want our arteries functioning at maximum capacity. And so um, that's why I encourage people to eat whole plant foods. Um, it seems like a good idea, but until then you realize it always goes back to, wow, in the form that it was created, in kind of food as grown, has all these beneficial effects when we start tinkering with it, extract out the sugar, add salt, all sorts of things, all of a sudden we're having these negative reactions. So whole food plant-based nutrition that includes both the fat kingdom and the sugar kingdom, as well as the protein kingdom. We shouldn't have protein powder shakes. We should get protein the way nature intended, which is uh, legumes, the healthiest source, beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, ideally every day, even three times a day, um, as per my daily dozen. Hi, my name is Joanna. First of all, I want to thank you for signing all of my four books, <laughs> taking your time for that. And my question is about mushrooms again. Uh, the, Swedish food, uh, the Swedish National Food Administration here in Sweden uh, says that you sh we should not eat more than 100 grams cooked and, and raw, uh, but especially raw uh, butter mushrooms and portobello mushrooms because they cause cancer, more than 100 grams a month. What do you say about that? Um, so, um, uh, so there's these compounds, hydrazine compounds found in raw mushrooms, destroyed by cooking, utterly destroyed by cooking. So we eat cooked mushrooms, not raw mushrooms. I have a video about that. Um, and mushrooms are beneficial. In fact, if I had a baker's dozen, daily dozen, if I added a 13th, maybe mushrooms would make the cut. Um, just because of their moon boosting benefits. And we actually have randomized controlled trials where you give kids mushrooms, and they actually have lower rates of common cold because it so boosts their immune function. Um, so I agree, we should not be eating raw mushrooms. We should cook our mushrooms, but then destroys these carcinogenic um, uh, compounds, and uh, that's why we should eat cooked mushrooms. And so there's no, uh, I know of no reason why one would want to avoid um, uh, cooked mushrooms with the exception of there's one type of mushroom you don't want to have with alcohol um, uh, because of a kind of a strange reaction. But uh, beyond that, and I have videos on all that, um, just type in mushroom at Nutrition Facts. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> I want to ask you about low blood pressure. Uh, because I ate your uh, recommended diet for a couple of months now and my blood pressure went down. Uh, of course I eat a lot less salt now, but what can I do or can it be the salt? Uh, so that's, that's what's supposed to happen. Blood pressure is <laughs> supposed to go down. But the, it's like I ate your diet and I got all healthy. Um, no, okay, no, but are you symptomatic? Like when you stand up, do you get dizzy, lightheaded? Yes. Or it's just the numbers low? No, uh, I'm DC and I can also be DC when I do things like walking and only standing up. Okay, that's not good. Okay, so what I mean, ideally, we want as low a blood pressure as possible without um, becoming symptomatic. Um, so we want to minimize the stress in our kidneys and our eyes and all these really sensitive tissues by keeping our blood pressure low, but not so low that we start getting dizzy and lightheaded. Um, and so, um, which is not supposed to happen. I mean, so there, there's something going on, whether it's neurological or, or 
heart rhythm, there's all sorts of things. And she, you, you could be anemia, there's a whole bunch of things. So I would go to your physician and I would say, I'm lightheaded, I'm dizzy, I'm in talk exactly under what circumstances you feel that way, and they should run some tests and get to the bottom of it. Um, it's uh, it's I've unlikely. Been there. I've been there. And they can't do anything with the medications, and and they got so much side effects, so it's nothing for me. So <laughs> I'm sorry. What did they want to put you on? Medication. Do you know what they wanted to put you on? No, I can't remember. Oh. Well, okay. So, but that that suggests to me that there is actually an underlying medical problem because you would not treat with medication. Uh, just a low blood pressure from a healthy diet. So that suggests to me maybe, but I don't know, there's a couple of things that they the, could... The, the question is, can, can my lower salt intake have... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Have, you lower your sodium intake, your blood pressure should drop. And some people it doesn't, but most people you drop your sodium intake, blood pressure should drop, and that's a good thing. We want to uh, keep our uh, sodium down. Now it's possible that you have some uh, issue with your kidneys and it's and your and your levels are dropping too low and and so there's rare circumstances where you'd actually um, uh, supplement people's uh, diet with salt people with certain uh, the, on certain drugs and things can can get kind of salt wasting conditions but uh, in general we want to cut out any salt out at the table uh, in the dining room, in the kitchen, and avoid processed foods to get our sodium consumption down, ideally under 1,500 milligrams. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we have a last question because it's uh, 9 o'clock already, and I know there's a lot of more questions, but uh, there's a lot of more people to sign the books. So we have a last question, and it's, uh, I think, from the future. What? <laughs> uh, what she meant was that I'm studying medicine. So ah, the last question we great. To that. We need good doctors out there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you mentioned in your uh, presentation that your uh, grandma uh, was some sort of drive for you to study medicine. Uh, but you also mentioned that the nutrition wasn't the most uh, central piece of the uh, yeah courses and classes. Uh, how was it to like? learn all this by yourself, how did you do it, uh, and did you experience any setbacks during that time due to yeah, your colleagues and the fellow students not being aware of it? Yeah. So less than a quarter of medical schools in the States have a single dedicated course in nutrition. The average amount of nutrition education for um, doctors in the States is just about a few hours. Um, I went to the school with the most nutrition in uh, um, uh, the country, which was uh, tough, so 21 hours. Out of thousands of hours of preclinical instruction, 21 hours um, uh, of nutrition instruction. And I had the benefit of knowing, um, uh, of you know, having this within our family, realizing um, the, the power of diet. And then, of course, when Ornish, in July 23rd, 1990, in The Lancet published his landmark lifestyle heart trial, proving uh, what we had known for a long time. There in black and white, some of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, that the number one killer could be reversed, cured with a plant-based diet. I was like, this is it. I mean, you know, it's all over, right? My family had known it, but now everybody's got to know it. And all there were were chirping crickets for decades while well, hundreds of thousands of people continue to perish with a preventable, arrestable, reversible disease. And I was like, wait a second. If our number one killer could get lost down some rabbit hole, ignored what else is there out there? And so I looked for a, a resource, an objective place. There's so much commercial corruption within the field of nutrition. Yeah, the California Raisin Marketing Board will tell you raisins are good for you. And the Watermelon Promotion Board will tell you watermelon's good for you. The National Cattlemen's Beef Association will say, no, beef is the best thing for you. But where could I get an objective? What's the science say about the healthy stuff to eat? It didn't exist, so I had to create it. I, the nutritionfacts.org is what I wanted as a medical student. I wish it existed, it didn't, so I was like, oh, all right, I'll have to do it. And so that's what I did, and I hope you um, uh, we'll be able to benefit from it, and so you don't have to go through the, you know, uh, the, the, you know, the, the months in the, in the medical uh, school library basements that I had to go through to just, you know, catch up on the literature. 
uh, which unfortunately didn't have a corporate budget driving its promotion. You hear about the latest drugs the latest surgical intervention because there's a press release. There's like a corporate budget driving his promotion, putting ads on TV for the latest drug to ask your doctor about. But when a new study comes out about how broccoli is good for you, you're not going to hear about it. We're going to hear about that. Right? There's no money. There's no lobby. There's no, there's no money to be made. And so even if it, your, your family could profit, if it's not going to help the shareholders, of some uh, um, corporate entity, unfortunately, we don't get it out. So we just need someone to go in there, get the information, spread it out to people. That's what I'm doing the best I can, and I'm so happy to be here to do it. Thank you so much.